So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, today is, uh, historically, we brought a state of the school district where we hold it in the high school CPA. Today is a state of the school district, also a community input session, um, working through Zoom for multiple reasons. We've had great participation through this format. It, this is one of the positive learnings through the pandemic. And with the different COVID protocols, it's a little easier to do it this way right now. So the overview of the night, I'm gonna spend 30 minutes to an hour going over a little bit of history, reviewing where we are today and how we got here, uh, reviewing some feedback from families and allowing some opportunities for some feedback, talking about what we do in our schools that you may not completely know about. Um, it's been a couple of years since we were in, in a no, almost normal school mode. And as your kids have moved through the district, there are programs and opportunities that you see as you move from building to building, but I'd like to give you a full overview of how the district is set up and what we offer. Um, I'd like to review what we've done so far with ESSER funds, which are federal stimulus dollars, and get some input from stakeholders on your thoughts of what else we should consider doing. And I'd like to talk about our current strategic plan and open for feedback. So I'm gonna weave some of these in together because it was a logical approach. So I'm gonna start off with a little bit of history. So the Dexter Community School District is, a, is approximately 84 square miles. The city of Dexter is about two square miles. All of our buildings are located on this campus other than our transportation facility. So we go all the way up from the Chain of Lakes, all the way out to Whitmore Lake area, all the way down into Freedom Township in Lodi. So it's spread out in this V shape but it's really, I think it's important to, know, to see the map because not everyone really, oh, and even when I first moved here, wrapping your head around where the district is and is not, is just fascinating. It's a very, it's a vast spread out district with all of our schools centrally located. So the history of the school district, it, as a community, all of our students historically attended a one room schoolhouse or the school that was in town. In the 1930s, Copeland, which is on Dexter Ann Arbor, was the school. In the 50s and 60s, Dexter Elementary School was built, which is now Bates School. Wiley was built as the middle school. And then the high school was built, which is now Creekside Intermediate. So we went from one room schoolhouses to the school to several schools right next to each other. And then Copeland continued to be used as a school. In 1995, Cornerstone Elementary, which is now called Anchor Elementary was built and opened and Mill Creek Middle School was built. In 2002, Dexter High School, which is located on Parker Road was built and our current K2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 through 12 configuration was set up. In 2014, we were get the, through the generosity of the Jenkins family, we were given the Jenkins Early Childhood Learning Center and that allowed us to start programming from six weeks of age through kindergarten. In 2019, Beacon Elementary was built, which is attached now to Anchor Elementary, which is the former cor cornerstone. And it became the Dexter Early Elementary Complex. Bates School, the building that is, was one of the original schools, it was Dexter Elementary School, became home to our community education program and expanded early childhood. And then the Siriani building, which is located on Shield Road between Al Ritt Field and the, uh, the bridge, was built for alternative education students. In 2020, the Copeland building was sold to the Encore Theater and our administrative offices moved to Bates. So just a little history on where, when things were built and how we've gone about kind of the, uh, the configuration and the changes. So I'm going to zip through. We have, we're fortunate to have 360 contiguous acres for a campus. We couldn't get a nice drone photo. They also could get Jenkins in the picture, but it's located right here, right at the border to border trail. And then we, as a district, own these 90 acres next to the twin turfs on Parker Road. And the board has been really forward thinking historically on what other land and properties we need to own. We own several houses that connect our properties so that we can have a contiguous campus. So the Jenkins building, the Jenkins Early Childhood Learning Center is located on Baker Road, right, right across the street from Bates. And the Jenkins Center serves 
um, students is, or children as young as six weeks old up through the time they start school in year round programming. Bates is located, it used to be an elementary, was Dexter Elementary School, is located right on Baker Road, serving preschool, community ed, and the board office. Over at Anchor and Beacon, they're on Dan Hoey in the Dexter Early Elementary Complex. And I'm gonna show you some pictures in the middle of the two buildings, connecting the buildings of these two, two spaces. So in those buildings or in that space right here, it looks pretty unassuming from the outside, but inside we've built flexible learning spaces designed with the teachers to set. What we did is when we knew we were gonna build flex spaces and we have flex spaces in every building other than the high school, we were working on that project short, right before the pandemic and it, it's coming in the bond work coming up in the next several years. <clears throat> but we met with our teachers and we asked, what is it you would like to do in your classrooms that you cannot currently do? And one of the things they said is they wanted some reading areas, some reading nooks that were kids with some soft seating and kind of spread out. They wanted to be able to have some kind of imaginary play area. So we built an area called Tiny Town. They wanted to be able to do some large group and small group breakouts. So we built a space. This is one of the two learning spaces that could handle all of these, all of these operations. And then we built the workshop because they also said they wanted a place to view and record mo movies and videos. So we have this area here where we have a large screen seating for at least one class. We can close it off. But they wanted to set up week long projects and they wanted to do some messy work. So we put in a garage door, a science area where we can bring in loads of dirt. And if you've been in this space at all, our teachers set up some incredible incredible projects. We just had some pumpkin vines they were working through with the little kids last week. We've done some incredible things. And it's great as we've moved towards the end of this pandemic, the more we've been able to use the space. So Anchor Elementary and Beacon Elementary are attached. We have science areas that attach and those two flexible spaces. We've reconfigured all of the classrooms to put in flexible furniture, writable tables, a lot of unique kind of uh, spaces that allow us and everyone with little kids knows they like to sit on the floor. They like to sit anywhere other than a normal chair. So we've adapted. We have these hokey stools. We have soft seating that they sit on. We've built, we have rugs that give them spaces. We've really designed our spaces for kids. So then Wiley Elementary is third and fourth grade. In the back of Wiley Elementary is the home to the Dreadbots, our high school robotics team. They actually work out of there in the evening. <clears throat> so Wiley Elementary, we have uh, full programming and those of you that have children have gone through there. It's a fantastic place for kids. Creekside is fifth and sixth grade. We have a garden, kitchen garden program. They do a winter survival day out in the woods. We do own all of those woods behind the building backing up to Mill Creek, that is the uh, Dexter Environmental Education Center. Then over at Mill Creek, we have seventh and eighth grade. The building was designed for the type of teaching that we do with the team system. We send the kids to a seventh grade camp at the start of the year, and then we send them to DC in eighth grade. Um, Dexter High School is home to ninth through 12th graders, and we have several of our athletic facilities over there. We have a large center for performing arts. We have an amphitheater that is set up with turf on the uh, steps so that we can use it year round and not have to worry about weeds. And then the Siriani building is located, actually it's on the other side of El Rid. I gotta move my arrow. Um, the Siriani building is housed for our alternative education program where we have upwards of 20 students at any given time and 20 different plans. We just had our first graduate of this school year finish up all of his classes this week. And what happens is the students it's self-paced. If they wanna finish, they can finish as quickly as they want. And we've partnered with community organizations like Rotary and the Lions Club. We partnered with Washtenaw Community for programming. It's a really unique program. <coughs> Other facilities, we have this wonderful, because of the, the generosity of our voters and our community, wonderful twin turf practice facility, practice and game facility. We have the CPA, our pools, our swim program is fantastic. 
So I wanted to give some background on the buildings. And just to give you an idea, because we've been out of the buildings consistently for a while this year, we're in. And many of our students were in second grade when we shut down. Now they're at Wiley or they were in third, just really enjoying Wiley. Now they're at Creekside or Creekside. Now they're at Mill Creek and they've transitioned. So we've been, I thought it was important to just go through a few things. What I want to do now is just get some feedback. So in your thoughts, what are some things we're doing well? And what would you like us to improve about the educational experience we provide students? I'm going to put this up and get this started. If you can just scan over the QR code and it'll take you to a link or the website to be able to enter your thoughts. And then please take some time to score each other's thoughts. We'll go, uh, I talked for a little bit. I'll bump it down. We'll go another three minutes or so and just take a few minutes and pop those in and we'll see, uh, we'll see what you think we're doing well and what you'd like us to improve, improve about. So again, just scan over the QR code, or you can go on a browser and just type in tejoin.com and type this code, in, this number in 271-255-509. And it'll take you to be able to enter your thoughts on what are some things we're doing well, and what would you like us to improve about the educational experience we provide students? Ideally, if you put those in separate, so if you had something we're doing well, you put that in, and then something you want us to improve about, you put it as a separate thought, that makes it a little easier for the ratings and to sort the data. So it looks like we have 19 participants. I'm not really sure how many people we have on tonight, 68. So it'll pick up. So at about a minute 30, I'm gonna go over to a screen to start seeing the thoughts. So if you haven't, taken your camera over that QR code or gone on the website, tejoin.com and typed in that number. It's a good time to do that real quick. I'm gonna scroll over to the next page and see what some of the thoughts are. So some positives, it sounds great, motivated teachers and staff. Teachers are excellent. That we follow the health department recommendations. Um, great teachers, keeping kids in the buildings. COVID protocols, forward thinking with future facilities. Would love to see more chemistry curriculum in middle school. Okay, that's good to know. Um, more hands-on learning. I'd like to talk about that a little more. That is an area we're working pretty intensely on. Um, see some people that have put thoughts and haven't done any ratings, so if you can. I love this graphic because it shows how many are engaging and where the thoughts start to cluster. So again, what are we doing well and what would you like to see us do to improve the educational experience? Including parents in the education of our children, uh, doing well, consider the needs as they start a more regular year. Love the teachers and staff. Doing well with considering kids' needs to start more. Oh, I already read that one. All right, I'm going to go to the next page, which is the easier one to read. So thank you for the, the positive comments on teachers and administrators rolling with the challenges of the pandemic, motivation of teachers. Our teachers are phenomenal. Um, and our administrative team is a, is a extremely talented and dedicated group of administrators. Um, just reading through these. Strong readers, that's great. Variety of classes at the high school. That is an area we're continuing to expand upon. 
flexibility for learning. We, we try I'm going to talk about pathways in a little bit. Um, communication from our child, children's teachers that we really try to work through a consistent communication process. Um, soliciting input from parents, the book clubs for parents, that is an area we've uh, dabbled in every few years that we find to be really work well. Challenge younger students who are academically gifted. That's, we'll talk about pathways in a little bit and some of the work we're doing there. Um, all right, this is really helpful. Improve, communicate contingency education plans proactive for quarantine. Okay, that is, that's really helpful. Promote WCC as much as APIB at the high school level. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. That's, this is very, very helpful, thank you. So it take a little bit of time and share some of the things we have in motion this year and then start giving you some overview of what, wh how we got or arrived at the programming we're at and where we're looking to go next. So things that we have in motion, we've been moving forward with strategic planning and soliciting feedback for adjustments and modifications. We started, uh, I'll talk about strategic plans, um, and we actually were really close to having the newest plan completed about the time that everything shut down back in March of 2020. So we've had to retool based on things we've learned. We were able to move some things forward, and then we'll have to change paths a little bit because of the pandemic, and that we've learned a lot. Um, living the learner profile in our schools. I'll talk about the learner profile a little bit, which is that SHIP logo with the nine, care, nine uh, competencies around. Um, ESSER funding. So we are working on ESSER funding programming. I'm going to ask for some input later in this session. This is stimulus funding. So currently, one of the first thing we did is we reduced our class sizes at our elementary schools. So we have, they're the lowest they've been in probably a decade. We purposefully did this. We said, let's make our classes as small as possible so that we can have room with the kids if, based on the pandemic and we can have better, stronger relationships with the kids because of the pandemic. And we wanted to be able to try to, it's one strategy to help our students accelerate their learning and to continue to build community. We've been updating equipment through the district uh, we ran the Dread Strong Summer Program. We had, we had thousands, at one point, I think we had like 1,800 kids on our campus in the middle of the summer on one day. So it was a great program. We paid for it through stimulus funds, and we used those dollars to support our kids and our families. Um, we have created math pacing support. We have two additional teachers, one in uh, at Creekside in fifth and sixth, and one in seventh and eighth, seventh and eighth that are working on helping kids increase their pacing in math. We knew through the pandemic, when we looked at our data, our reading scores actually in those grades did not, they were, they were fairly consistent, all things considered, but our math, the students, because of working through, we were in March through June of 2020, we had to work through that initial, everybody shut down, locked in their house. And then we worked through, a hybrid, remote, hybrid, remote, full in. And math, we saw that our students progress, but not as quickly as they historically have. So we've broken down by student. We know where they were prior to the pandemic and who is progressing and who what and who slowed down and who is capable of more. And we're trying to work those students through to go a little quicker because they're they're capable, they're really ready and able. Uh, we moved to uh, three nurses in the district. We have historically had one. Um, right before the pandemic, we moved to two. We are now at three. And that is a great support for our families and our kids. Um, we're adding two more counselors, including a district-wide counselor. Two more social workers. One is going to be focused in the youngest grades. Another is district-wide. And their role is going to be to build a community support network. One thing we find with students that are struggling with mental health and families that are trying to support is that when there is a crisis or it's close to crisis, the families need someone to help them navigate what supports are outside the system. We have students for 1,098 hours per year. Clinical work is not our, 
area of expertise, but we are the connector for kids and for the community. So we want to try to build a network and community supports so that we can help families navigate what they need for their children when they need it. Um, we're also increasing school psychologist support. We have this reading action plan and additional staffing to support our youngest grades in their reading. We've done some facility updates. If you didn't notice this summer, we did, at one point, our entire campus looked like a game board. It was like a game of sorry. It was like every four squares, there was a bright red paint everywhere. So that was the cement work we did. We did about three hundred fifty dollars to $400,000 in cement work across the district. Um, we also replaced the high school tennis courts. There's 10 courts, brand new. We, uh, we continue to use the bond funds that were supported by our voters in 2017 to improve our facilities and keep be good stewards of taxpayer dollars by not letting our facilities rot and fall apart. We fix them. One thing we did during the pandemic is back in March of 2020, everybody shut down, was in their houses. In April, we were told that try to repurpose staff. We painted every building. While we had no students in there, we painted every school in our district. We have a million square foot of floor space. We painted a, we painted equivalent of a million square feet, roughly, of actual learning space and hallways. Um, we're looking to restructure some roles throughout the district to better need, meet the needs of our students. One thing we know, everywhere you go, around the area and around the country, everyone has a now hiring sign. We are short 48 staff. Instead of sitting back and trying to figure out how we're going to outpay others, because even the, when they're paying $20 an hour to work at a, to make subs or to work at a fast food place, they still can't fill the jobs. So we know what we're going to need to do is come up with some new solutions and not try to address the problem the same way we always have. So we are going to look to cre create some new solutions. One of those is creating a super sub utility player. So I'm a huge baseball fan. The concept was we need a Don Kelly or a Tom Brookins, or we need a few of them. Who could, who would be willing and able to, on any given day, maybe drive a bus if we need a sub driver, maybe sub in a classroom, maybe help with some athletic setups, help in the cafeteria, help with wherever our void is. Like right now we need someone to oversee our aquatics, uh, an aquatics manager to help with parties and with open swim, et cetera. So we need to find a true utility player. So if you know someone, send them our way. Um, <clears throat> and then we're also looking at opening up this weekly review process. We're, we're going to send this out to uh, the community. And what we know is that the majority of our employees live very we either live in Dexter or very close. We know we have a lot of families and community members who would like to help. But when they think about what a school hires for, often they think we need teachers and principals. They don't think of all the other roles. We have 570 employees. So what we're going to do is start sending out a request that anyone that is willing to help and help us work through supporting our programming, send us a one page summary of what you're willing to do and what your background is. And every week we're going to look at whatever we were sent and figure out, is there somewhere this person can help us and try to just be creative on how we're going to continue to support our kids. And what we know is that going by the old solutions, we've done the job fairs, we've increased some wages, we've increased benefits. That is not the method. We know that we generally keep our staff when they work here, it's a great place to work. But we also know we're part of a national sh worker shortage. We're going to have to approach the problem different in order to support our kids. So we're going to approach it differently. So speaking of approaching differently, last spring, we looked at, we know our K-2 kids, our youngest readers. The challenge when you're trying to teach reading is it's really hard to do in a remote setting. It's hard to do when you're physically distanced. And it's hard to do when you can't have those small groups and some of the interaction. And it's hard to do in masks. It's hard to do with the COVID protocols. But we knew we can, our kids have a ton of capacity and we could accelerate their reading if we were really purposeful. So we created a reading action plan that we started with what we needed to do in March. We worked through what we had to do this summer and what we have to do this school year. And it, inc it includes 
additional staffing to support. We also looked at how our initial strategic framework from started in 2015 of how we were going to champion learning, develop, educate, and inspire, which is our district vision. At that time, we said we needed to increase our systems and our organizational capacity. We needed to plan for growth. That's how we purposefully built buildings that made sense. They weren't, they weren't overly extravagant. So if you drive by Anchor and Beacon, it's a really nice looking building, but it's not excessive. Inside is where the kids are. We built that for kids. We built it great. Um, we looked at cradle to career. This is how we started with preschool. We started with a strategic plan and we said we'd like to offer preschool. And that's how we moved into, we had historically a couple classrooms, but now we have hundreds of kids from age six months old up through the time they start school. Instruction, we wanted to continuously improve our instruction both inside and outside the classroom walls. Innovation, we wanted to really be innovative and we wanted to create a community learner. So we talk about community book studies, et cetera. That was about the community learners. So we've been working on our new strategic plan. And we started this work in 2019 with the plan to have it approved in the summer of 2020. And then the world changed. So our process, we started with stakeholder focus groups, classroom visits, and stakeholder surveys. We created what we called an opportunity analysis report. We analyzed that. We did some community feedback. We did leadership feedback and teacher feedback. And then we worked through the strategic planning process. At every level, we asked for input. We are at a point now that the plan is pretty close to done and we'd like input and we're gonna ask for some of that input tonight. So our strategic plan, this is the draft as of November 4th, 2021. It would go through 2026. Our initiatives that came out of that initial um, opportunity analysis and those focus groups, the surveys, the visits to the building, we brought in some external groups to go walk into our classrooms and tell us what we think we're doing. Does it match what you see? So we came up with these strategic initiatives and the initiatives are the Dexter Community Schools community will work together to develop, educate, and inspire students for an ever-changing world. We'll foster a culture of connectedness by focusing on social emotional needs and building trusting relationships throughout all level, levels of the learning community. We'll transform instructional practices to support social emotional learning, life skills, and content that provide our students with flexible pathways for learning. <clears throat> we'll enhance the learning environment for all students by providing educational experiences within and beyond the classroom. And we'll stand for justice and equity by promoting, promoting meaningful and sustainable actions to create an inclusive learning and working environment that embraces diversity of ideas, experiences, and voices. So to go into a little detail, we have an area on vision, an area on culture, one on our learning continuum, one on extended learning, and one on diversity, equity, and inclusion. In terms of vision, one thing we found when we did the opportunity analysis was that our vision of champion learning, develop, educate, and inspire. People knew the words. They did not know what that meant. So we've spent some significant time unpacking it. What we did to unpack it is we met with student groups. We talked, met with staff and surveyed staff. We surveyed all of our community. And then we actually built a database of 10,000 alumni and we surveyed our alumni. And you may remember receiving a postcard. And this was the postcard from several years ago of what are the most important skills, knowledge and character traits our graduates need to be successful in their futures. We took all of that input. We had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of community members answer these, this question. We had staff answer this question. We have students answer this question and alumni from all over the world answer this question. And we came up with these specific skills. And I'm gonna exit out of this because I wanna show you, it lives on the website. It's completely transparent of what we're looking at. So what we said, or what we found is that champion learning, develop, educate, and inspire. The knowledge and skills and characteristics that all of the groups agreed with that our graduates needed was they needed to be able to collaborate. 
And then we spent time, we've defined what collaborate means. They needed to be creative and critical thinkers. They needed to be effective communicators. And we've defined what we mean by that. In terms of educate, we knew we need our, in school content knowledge is kind of what we were designed to do. What came out of those surveys is our students needed information literacy. They need to know how to assess access and evaluate information and use and manage information. As we've lived through the last several years, there's been no bigger time in human history that trying to figure out what is accurate information and evaluate that information has ever been this, this important. We also found all of our alumni and all of our parents were clear. We need to help kids develop financial literacy. In terms of inspire, we uh, narrow down to our kids need to have initiative. They need to have personal responsibility and resilience, and they need to demonstrate kindness and empathy. And we've defined what we mean by that. This year, we're trying to focus on the kindness and empathy area. We've then taken a step further. During the pandemic, we worked with our staff to link for each of these competencies. So for example, for collaboration, We've created a competency set of what this looks like on a zero to eight continuum. Zero is preschool, eight is graduate. So what does it look like as a kid goes from preschool through early L, as they move into Wiley and then into Creekside, as they move from Creekside to Mill Creek, as they move into the high school, what do we really mean by collaboration and what does that look like? And we've done this for every one of these competencies. So we've spent some significant time through the pandemic moving forward, all out of the strategic planning process. Anyone that runs organizations knows that effective strategic plans are not a document you build with checklists that you then give yourselves awards when you finish the task. They're living, breathing documents that as you're building the plan, you're moving the plan forward. And that's what we're doing. So our evidence of progress is we need to build the do building level unpacking of the draft continuum that I showed you. We need to building level vision related to the helm. That's that that um, ship's wheel, ship wheel logo, and then classroom unpacking. Probably not going to make it by November. We wrote this when we thought we'd be in school normal because it looked really promising in June. We're in school as normal as we can, but. We, we're a little optimistic. And then we've set up our evidence of progress going all the way to 2024. In terms of culture, that we wanted to foster a culture of connectedness by focusing on social emotional needs and building trusting relationships throughout all levels of our learning community. We've outlined what we wanna do with culture. We're gonna be collecting some baseline data soon and then continue or building our continuous growth levels of timeline and unpacking with a plan to move evidence of progress through the next five years. <clears throat> the learning continuum that will transform our instructional practices to support social emotional learning, life skills and content that provide our students with flexible pathways for learning. I wanna talk through what we've done so far and what we plan to continue working on. So we have our intended outcomes. We'll have this on the website after tonight, this pr presentation. And we have our intended outcomes and some internal work we're doing and some external work. What we've done, this is in terms of pathways. This is where we are as a district. So it used to be that kids went from kindergarten and they just went through high school and they went through our programming. We really feel that there is no one size fits all model of school. Not every kid will be as successful as they can be if we try to use the exact same instructional practices with every kid. You, for those of you that have multiple children, you see this all the time. One of your children does great in traditional school models that, and even school models aren't as traditional as what you think. They're really, school continues to evolve and we learn more about the brain and we technologies infusion and things that we know now that we didn't know 40 years ago. But you know that you have one child does well in this model, but another child struggles in this model, so they need something different. 
So we want to take into account that every kid is a unique individual and give them options. So preschool, we start with six weeks old up through five years, and that's at Jenkins and at Bates. Then we have our elementary kids go through Anchor, Beacon, and Wiley. And we have personalized learning models. Wiley's got a great model that they work through that in a longer presentation I did last year, I went through in some detail. Then when kids get to Creekside, they have their choice of going Pinnacle or Summit. And if they choose one in fifth grade, they can move in sixth grade. They're not in a pathway forever. They can try and see what works for them and then change. And then when they move to Mill Creek, they can do Pinnacle, Summit, or Apex, which is a hybrid of the two. And they can move between options. And then when they get to the high school, there's lots of options at the high school. This year, we just moved to a block schedule where students take eight classes, four classes per day. The long-term plan is to give kids lots of opportunities to take elective courses and to not load up with every academic course they can. They need a chance to be high school kids and they need a chance to explore. If you think about your children as they go through Mill Creek and Creekside, they really get a ton of chance to explore different options and different areas. They can do visual video production. They can do some coding. We have a class on the Civil War at, uh, at Mill Creek that the kids absolutely love. They can dabble and learn. So when they get to the high school, we have students can take a variety of courses and programming wise, we offer an alternative education program over at the Siriani building. We offer advanced placement courses. We have the Dexter Early Middle College. The Dexter Early Middle College is in the first group, the first cohort are seniors right now. The way an early middle college works is we have partnered with Washtenaw Community. We have a group of students that will, at the beginning of their junior year, decide that they're an early middle college student. They'll stay a Dexter student for five full high school years. At the end of that fifth year, so they're going to be a super senior. At the end of that fifth year, they will receive both a Dexter High School diploma and either an associate's degree from Washtenaw Community that we paid for, or they will receive a, a certificate in a career field that they chose, or they'll receive, and we're working on the final process on this, the Michigan Transfer Agreement, 24 transferable credits to a four-year institution. We also offer dual enrollment, which is just if a student wants to take one or two Washtenaw courses that we pay for. Um, we have the Early College Alliance. Kids can enter as soon as ninth grade and they attend high school at Eastern Michigan University. And they receive either a certificate or an associate's degree after five years. And they stay at the Eastern Michigan University campus the entire time, but they're still a Dexter student. We have International Baccalaureate, the diploma program. Only a handful of schools in Michigan offer IB. It's an international curriculum. It's really meant to have students think on a broader sense, learn in an inquiry model. And it is a phenomenal program. It's extremely rigorous to do the full diploma, but taking courses is like taking an, an advanced course and you find kids will take the courses they're really interested in. We have what we call consortium, which are career technical education courses. We offer a graphic arts program here at Dexter where kids learn to design and create print media. We have a $55,000 printer in that program that can print anything. We can print brochures, posters, high, high level graphics. We also teach kids how to print t-shirts and banners and how to, how to do all the work in that in graphic arts. Meanwhile, we offer programs where they can travel to a group of high schools. We have Milan, Lincoln, Celine, Manchester, Chelsea, and Dexter are all part of a consortium of schools that offer career tech ed programs where kids go from school to school to learn areas that to find a welding instructor in every high school is impossible. However, we can offer a welding program together. So we offer career technical ed programs. We're looking to expand those opportunities in Dexter and in other schools. WAVE is the Washington Alliance for Virtual Education. That's another program. And then last we last fall or last winter, we had a group of teachers and administrators that spent an entire, entire semester in research and development 
of what we call Spark. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Spark. We're doing a phased implementation this fall and looking to go even bigger next, next fall. So Spark is founded on the principle that Everyone has something valuable to contribute to society and our collective potential lies in nurturing our individuality. So in other words, instead of saying you're going to take these classes and this is what you're going to learn, it's passion driven. It's a joyful journey of self-discovery and growth. Kids can look, work through the learner profile and have strong relationships with their teachers, but have real deep voice and choice in what they wanna study. So the focus for this year is that we wanted to do a lot of place and project-based learning. Some examples, just a week ago or two weeks ago, Beacon Elementary students were doing the butterfly garden and milkweed planting so that they, they could learn how plants grow, how that system works to attract butterflies. And in the spring, they should have some milkweed, hopefully that will have some butterflies. Wiley has been doing some local tree identification and some owl habitat work, learning right in our community. Mill Creek, we have a classroom that's been doing a mobility challenge with the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Learning, or Living, sorry. So they've, what they've done is they've looked at the ADA ramp guidance and they've evaluated building ramps for ADA compliance. They created a unit assessment including a project that designed a ramping system for a garage that preserved the useful space, but met ADA guidelines. They developed an assessment criteria for the project. They self-assessed their own work. They've met with physical therapists who talk about challenges that students have navigating different buildings. They work with the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living on disability awareness workshops. They're now continuing through the fall by looking at other connections and engineering practices with civic action and communication and multimedia. What we're trying to do is take an opportunity for kids. We know that not every bit of learning in their life is going to come from a book. That having grounded in a great place like Dexter in this area, they can learn what we need them to learn to be successful in life in a way that they're truly passionate about it. Then the part I'm really excited about, as we get working. And this is the year where we're starting to cry, figure out the logistics to creating these experiences. We would like to offer extended learning opportunities to our students that happen both within and outside our classroom. And an extended learning opportunity by definition are opportunities that enable learners to gain knowledge and skills outside of the traditional classroom. They're often community-based with partner engagement. They're flexible opportunities that include rigorous, authentic problem solving and in, in inquiry that connect with learners' interests and passions. The learning activities can be learner driven, designed by the learner, and credentialed by a teacher. What we're trying to work on this year is to creating a, a group of experiences of 10 to 20 hours of time built on a skill identified or a competency in the helm. So something about communication or collaboration, et cetera. Um, and then put, allow our middle and high school students first to engage in these extended learning opportunities and then somehow credential and badge it so that students can start to track their extended learning. Ultimately, we'd like to make that part of our normal school program. This year, we're trying to create what these would look like, criteria, how to badge it, how to really formulate these partnerships, and we'll be hopefully sometime this winter starting our first group, first offering of an, of an ELO. <clears throat> so our goal is to have a menu and a support structure provided sometime in the next several years. We'd like to have at least one or two ELOs set up this year that some students can participate in to help us work through how to scale it. And then Diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion. What we know is that all of our students will be asked to be competitive workers in a society that assumes an ability to work in a diverse world. However, our students, they don't live in a multicultural setting in their daily educational environments in Dexter. This requires us to have an increased focus from Dexter Community Schools to help prepare our students and to best educate all of our students. What we mean by that is that at some point, Oops, I want to go back a little bit. At some point, 
We would like to get back to a place in our schools and in society where people can approach a, a problem or an issue from differing, per, differing perspectives and actually have a conversation where nobody is vilified and we learn through the conversation. And we can have these deep conversations to understand each other and to understand why someone would see the world this way, why someone else would see it this way, and learn as neighbors so we can make the world a better place for our kids and so our kids can effectively function in a world that is going to look different than what they see in our schools. So as we plan for the use of our stimulus funds and we move forward with our strategic plan, what are the most important things our district needs to think about in order to support all of our students? So what I ask is if you can go into the thought exchange and I'm gonna to flash to the other screen in a second. And thinking of stimulus funds, what are the things you'd like us to do? And say stimulus or ESSER. And then in terms of strategic plan, what would you like us to think about that we haven't been thinking about in what I presented? So I'm gonna turn on the thought exchange here. And uh, if you can scan over the QR code or go to tejoin.com and type in that number and let us know and put them separate as thoughts. So if it has to do with ESSER funds, which is stimulus dollars, put ESSER funds. If it has to do with strategic plan, just put STRAT or a strategic plan, something. But what are, we, what are the most important things our district needs to think about in order to support all of our students? We've been working on pathways. We're trying to create extended learning opportunities. <clears throat> We've identified the necessary characteristics, knowledge, and skills for our kids to be successful when they graduate, according to teachers, parents, alumni, community members. And we've gone through and we're trying to figure out how to create a culture where our kids and our community can have true dialogue. So if you can take some time and give us some thoughts. If you can't tell, I'm nursing a cold. My voice is, my voice sounds worse than I feel. So going to take a break from talking for a second as you type these in. So if you haven't taken your uh, phone camera or iPad or tablet camera, and gone over the QR code, you can please do that or go on a browser to tejoy.com and type in that number. And uh, let us know if it's a thought about stimulus funds, so ESSER, that we need to think about, put ESSER and let us know. And if it's thought about strategic plan, put strat plan or SP or something. What are the most important things our district needs to think about in order to support all of our students? 30 participants. There's 64 people on the call the last I looked. 76, actually. So I'm waiting for some more to log in. Please rate each other's thoughts as you go. At about a minute 15, I'll flat, flip over to the thoughts. Right in a second, I'm going to flip over and look at the thoughts. So if you haven't scanned yet, this would be a good time to do it. Okay, mental health support. Dread Strong Summer. Guidance counselors to help parents choose and assess which learning pathways are right. That, that's helpful. We, uh, we do have three current counseling positions posted. Um, so if you know a great counselor, send them our way. Mental health support, we have increased. We have a, a large mental health plan. We need to fill these other positions to scale out the last parts of it. That was a high focus prior to the pandemic. We've retooled during the pandemic and now staffing positions will 
increase um, paid benefits to the parapros. We uh, continue to look at that. Um, it's there are some unique. Uh, we'd like to. We actually something we'll continue. Okay, we have a contract that opens this year with our ESP group, which is our paras, secretaries, buildings and grounds, food service, etc. We are part of a consortium that has some constraints that we just have to work through. Um, but we will work through it and figure it out collectively. Um, science, materials, education, lower elementary, that's good. Social workers and psych stuff, kids recover from pandemic stress. Yep, we posted uh, multiple additional uh, computer science PD for educators to integrate with math and science. Digital literacy, yep, that is, uh, that's great. Um, pathways, thank you for the kind words. Um, emerging le readers, we are, and that was that reading action plan, and we are uh, continuing to break down data and work on how we can help our kids with reading. We've also put in new programming and materials and training with our staff. I forgot to point that out point that out we've done significant literacy training that was actually our last training before everything closed down we did it on that friday i think or that saturday no, it was that friday uh march 2019 or whatever the day was was training on literacy and then we did some training last year we, that's all we've done with our elementary staff pretty much this year is training with new materials so let me go through the uh the thoughts so mental health support Benefits to the paras, uh, enough guidance counselors, summer programming, more paras. Um, we have 73 paras right now. As a county, the entire county has 1,100 paras and about 250 openings as a county. We have about 11 openings right now. So if you know anybody would like to, would like to work with kids, we'd love to have them. Um, more social workers summer program it was uh it was so much fun for the kids um facility upgrades something we're always going to do bonuses to bus drivers our bus drivers are awesome they really are and we're so fortunate to have them and if you know anybody else wants to work driving a bus we have uh we're always we pay for training and we actually have some of the highest salaries around for bus drivers um, supporting students on both the top, top and bottom ends of the academic spectrum. That is actually something with the pathways that we are really committed to is that we know some students are really strong in some subject areas are really interested and not so much in others. And we wanna find ways to try to tap into their interest in every subject and help them grow. And the, if you look, for example, in our summit programming is a good example, our kids just they're able to choose their pace and continue to go a little quicker if they choose to, but they can also go at the pace that works for them and we support. Uh, additional clubs and sports after school. True individualized learning. We're still working on that, but we, it is a high goal. Um, athletic fees, okay, that is really good to know. That was something we changed right before the pandemic to try to even it out, but that is really helpful. Um, tutoring, free lunches is, we're just thankful to the Fed, federal government for that. One thing that is truly, and here's one of the challenges, supply chain has not left us unharmed at, with lunch and food. We can give free lunches, but trying to get the food and get enough of the right food to make the lunches has become a, a huge challenge for schools. It's gotten a little better recently, but it's been a challenge. But we still, we have a great staff that always just figures it out. Um, uh, innovative technology. Okay, that is helpful. Uh, we do a lot, but it goes in pockets. We do need to streamline that. Various paths and some support for families. Training. We've done a significant amount of our educator equity training. We've sent, I think about, I wanna say it's half to two thirds of our teacher and administrative staff for formal training. 
<clears throat> right now we can't pull anybody out for training anymore because we don't have any subs, but uh, get the kids off the screens. We do, we do use a lot of technology, but when you look at what it looks like in the schools, the screen is there as a resource, but the kids are truly engaged with each other most of the time. And that's a goal. Um, problem place-based learning with semis. We actually have our, uh, Wiley is deeply involved in semis as a, I, we have multiple members. We've been members of semis for several years. Um, sixth grade athletics. That's that, it's an area we like to look at. If anybody ever, anybody that has a middle school student athlete, you see the challenges with trying to find games and the fluctuation in schedules. But we do try to run through community ed as many things as we can so that kids can have, uh, so kids can have um, opportunities. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop the sharing. And then if you'd like to talk, um, if you'd like to say anything or ask a question, I'm just gonna open up for, you know, a little bit of time for just open Q and A. So if you have any uh, thoughts or questions, let me uh, move this. Just raise your hand, and I'll um, I'll turn on your mic and answer whatever you want, or try to answer. I think the hand raising works. I don't see anybody that's raised their hand though. Oh, there we go. Okay, Rebecca. Let me. Uh... Hey, Chris. Yeah. Um, my question is really simple. All of this money that we got related to COVID to help the district and all of these great programs we've been able to implement, how do we sustain that after that funding goes away? That is a great question. And that's a high priority for us. So what our approach is, is we've been looked at looking at our strategic plan that we are working on already and trying to work through how do, how do we whatever we do, we always want it to be sustainable. So like the addition of counselors and social workers, we have found, we, we have committed to sustaining that. Um, we need to, that, I was a superintendent during the last stimulus. And what happened is we received millions and millions of dollars. Two years later, we took a $470 per student cut and only recovered about a year ago from that cut. So, it's something that we really value here because we don't want to go up and down a roller coaster. There are districts that are just spending because they have, they feel they have to. We are trying to be as thoughtful as possible. So everything is sustainable. Whatever we add, we plan to sustain. The Dread Strong Summer was one-time funds. I don't know if we can sustain that. We, to do that for free, we spent about a million dollars running that program. Um, that is not long-term sustainable, but it did inform some things that we could offer and try to figure out how to run in a different format or some tuition or some in another way. So that is the, I thank you for asking that question. All right, let's go, Steve. Steve, I got you You're all set to talk. There you go. Yeah, can you hear me, Chris? Yep. Perfect. Hey, um, the listing that you went through with the high school, um, the different learning platforms, uh, where does Summit, you have Summit fifth through eighth grade, where does Summit fall into that? And is there some sort of self, uh, self-directed self model? Can you talk a little bit more about that? You've given us so much information that um, I, I just want to see where uh, the, the kids that go through Pinnacle or Summit, where the pathways that can continue for them through education. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we... Uh, we summit ends at eighth grade, but what we've been working on is, and in terms of learning management system, we use Canvas from third grade up in all of our non-summit rooms, which is the majority of the district. So our teachers have been really becoming extremely proficient in Canvas. We've worked on how to do playlists. We're actually looking at with, with the Spark um, research and development was how, how we do that. We've been working with high school staff. We just moved to the block schedule. And we know that with that helm and the competency model, we can, that's our method. 
to try to organize everything and finish off the high school opportunities for kids. We run a great program for high school kids. And what we'd like to do is try to formalize some options. So we have a variety of options, but we'd like to try to bridge that, that gap a little cleaner um, for our students moving from summit or pinnacle as they go up. And we, a lot of what you see in the high school, our kids, the technology is still there. Some of the pacing still there. The individual opportunities are still there depending on the course and level, but we're, we're looking to try to tie that up. That's a focus of this year. Anyone else with any questions? I don't see any more. Um, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us. It's uh, I wasn't sure we'd finish in an hour. I know I went over a lot. I wanted to give a good overview of the district, kind of tell where we are, some of our challenges and some of our opportunities and continue to add into that thought exchange. We appreciate it. And um, just thank you very much. And uh, as always, go Dreads. <laughs>